I turned my geography lesson at the time. I was trying to get them to understand the map. So I wanted them to know the hemispheres. I wanted them to know the oceans, the continent. These are sixth graders. Mm. And a lot of them were not proficient at any of those things. First day I brought it into class and the kids were like, I didn't even play the beat. I just started rapping it and they knew the cadence. I love, love our kids. <laughs> and so once I dropped the beat, everybody wanted to do it. What's up, y'all? I'm JP. Hey, hey, I'm Kara. I'm Juanes. And this is The Nugget where we speak with talented and accomplished guests to learn the nuggets to their success to inspire us to pursue our goals and our dreams. Today, we have Erica Buddington, who's a public historian, author, and screenwriter who uses her unconventional methods and vast knowledge of black history and pop culture to create accessible learning experiences in and out of academic spaces. After a decade in the classroom, she's become the founder and CEO of Langston League, a consultant firm that designs culturally relevant instructional material and professional development. With clients like Google Code Next, Monkey Paw Productions, Netflix, NBC Universal, Mega Evers College, Harlem Children's Zone, and many others. She's been featured on the Steve Harvey Show, Forbes, Buzzfeed, Black Enterprise, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> For combining these three things, the things that she's most passionate about, Performance, education, and representation. Welcome, Erica Buddington. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Now we're just gonna jump right into it. A huge moment throughout your career and your life is when you went viral. Now I know you've talked about this a lot of times. <laughs> we're not gonna stay yeah. on this. Which we... time though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're talking about, we specifically talking about the Bodak Yellow. Oh Lord. Okay. <laughs> What led to that moment? Because obviously you were comfortable being on camera with the kids and it seemed like they were already on that wave. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't surprise them or anything. Yeah, so um, I'm an MC at heart and a poet, so that's genuinely who mm -hmm. I am. And it shows up in my teaching. And it's something that at the beginning of my teaching career was suppressed because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of schools have protocols against that. You That's know what I was thing? thinking. It's like, that how did you do that? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was, first of all, I was in a school that was black owned with mm. predominantly black teachers mm. and predominantly black and brown students. So I think it was a little bit different there for us. The kids, they would, you know, they Google us. That's another thing. It's like, <laughs> you can't hide from kids. They, they find out your first and last name. They're like, oh boy. And they go Google you. Wow. So they would bring that up a lot. Like, we know you spit. Like, <laughs> wow. So they came like, to you first. Like, yeah, they would say that Spit some me. bars. One day I was teaching and Bodak Yellow was popping at the time. So they kept yelling out bloody shoes in the middle of my geography lesson. Like, oh Y'all can't show me where New York is on the map, but you, you interrupting the lesson. I'm trying to get us, you know, together. Literally, I was working in the prep room, I believe, and a car passed by and it was playing a song. I was like, there goes the damn song again. <laughs> like, not, the song is hot, but I was just like, again. And then I just said, wait a minute. Maybe God's trying to tell me something. <laughs> I turned my geography lesson at the time. I was trying to get them to understand the map. So I wanted them to know the hemispheres. I wanted them to know the oceans, the continent. These are sixth graders. Mm. And a lot of them were not proficient at any of those things. Mm. So, um, you know, I said, wait a minute. Let me just make this into a song. It'd be a really quick way to get them to proficiency so we could jump into ancient civilizations. Mm. That's what I did. I turned it into a song. First day I brought it into class and the kids were like, I didn't even play the beat. I just started rapping it, and they knew the cadence. I love, I love our kids. <laughs> yeah. They knew the cadence. It was like, that's Bodak Yellow. Like, you, that's what you're doing. And I, we were, I was like, how do y'all know that? And so once I dropped the beat, everybody wanted to do it. Are you enjoying the conversation? Please like and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to hit the bell for notifications and be the first to know when new episodes drop. Do you have any nuggets of wisdom to share? We'd love to hear from you on the nuggets you've learned. 
please comment below. I would say day one, we were like halfway proficiency. So half the class knew, it, knew the song and could identify the map. Mm. But by day five, there was like 98% of the class mm-hmm. knew could tell you everything on the map. And and I required them as they rapped the song to point out the continents to, and write them down to ensure that they labeled all their north, south, east, west, to, to ensure that they labeled the hemispheres. My principal was like, this is amazing. You know, you should keep using this. Mm-hmm. You should keep shaping different lessons you're trying to get through that they're having a tough time with mm. using your poetry and your rap and just you know, your animated self. And she felt like I was holding back. Mm -hmm. And she said, you don't got to hold back here. And then once I had permission, it was over. Mm -hmm. Like, so that was the first instance, but then... With 2.2 million hits. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then what? Um, I think I, I, I'm trying to remember how I, why I put it. You know, I think I just used to put stuff up and say like, hey, what do y'all think about this as a classroom strategy? Because online, Mm -hmm. I was very much um, curating my Twitter timeline to be full of educators and scholars who are just giving me feedback on my craft. Mm -hmm. Because to me, like it's, I'm, I'm a student. I'm always learning. Mm-hmm. Right, and so I never get to a space where I'm like I know everything. Never, I don't care how long I've been doing it. Mm-hmm. I'm always a student, mm-hmm. and so I'm always putting stuff up on my like, yo, what y'all think? Is this a good idea? I got a little feedback, and then I went to bed, and then I woke up, and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Classic. And I had hit like half a million views by the morning. Wow. So yeah, I'm currently an elementary school teacher, and so you talking Ooh. about how you intersect your sense of performance and your natural ability to flow with sharing information with the kids. It's just, I'm glowing because of this. And I was saying in another conversation, I think that's the difference between being a teacher and an educator, right? That you include ways that match the way that the students learn in order to get them the information. Do you kind of reflect on yourself as a student in your teaching and then say, wow, I understand how they think. So let me teach like this. I think that a lot of us come to teaching, and I don't know if it's the same for you, because there was somebody that shifted our perspective or our lives in that capacity, right? So I had an educator named Mr. Bowman in 11th grade. Um, He was my English teacher. He's from Crown Heights, Jewish man. He listened to Ludacris. Like, I remember just, like, hearing his headphones, and I'm like, what are you listening to? You know, I just never put two and two together. I would have never in a million years. Mm. Um, And that was the first thing that got my attention. It was, like, maybe the first month of class. I was like, you different. (laughs) He really pushed us on the text we were allowed to read in class. He didn't restrict us to holding Caulfield and, Mm -hmm. you know, Catcher in the Rye. Like, he was like, bring it to me, and if I feel like it's something that you can extrapolate whatever I need you to do. And like, sure, like Mm -hmm. bring it from the library. Let's talk about it. He incorporated music in our class too. He took us on trips that were very unorthodox. Mm -hmm. I remember overhearing by accident a conversation between him and my guidance counselor where she was like, you can't do this with them. And he was like, who says? Like, Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I like him. Uh So I just remember him being the rebel. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I ever get in front of students, which I did not intend to at that point in my life, I did not want to be a teacher. I wanted Mm -hmm. to be a writer. After I realized that being a forensic scientist required you to deal with blood, so I dropped out of science research class. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm going to write. So at that point, I did not intend to teach Mr. Bowman got me thinking a little bit, like, maybe, maybe this is something I do want to do. Mm. Did he get you into that rebel energy, or you already had that? I, no, I already had that. But <laughs> I, I think I wasn't brave enough to bring it into spaces where there was hierarchy, mm. right? Like, mm. you know, I had a, I was in after-school clubs. I was in classes at Hofstra. Like, I was a suburban kid and a bunch of stuff. That rebel would happen outside on the block when I was in Brooklyn with my cousins. Like, But the minute I stepped into those spaces, I was like, nope, good kid now. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Mr. Bowman said, uh-uh. Like, there are some spaces that require you to rebel. Mm-hmm. And even if they have protocol and policy, sometimes you got to push back for the greater good. And I was like, mm-hmm. I could do that? Like, he, he also gave me permission. We're getting to a theme of permission, I'm noticing. That's what I bring to my work now. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's how my experience as a student and what I want for my students and what I want for myself as a student Mm -hmm. intersect, right? You know, I'm always thinking about my work these days as not as an individual thing, but like, does this, how does this benefit the collective? Mm -hmm. How does it benefit everyone in the room, the human race, black race? Like, how does it, you know, it's not just about me. It's never been about me. And I think that started with first my parents, then Mr. Bowman, Mm. and then with my students who 
kept rapping in the middle of me doing my lesson. I think that was a rebellion <laughs> of their own. They were like, we bored. Mm. Engage us, mm-hmm. right? And so a lot of people like to blame students for that. Mm-mm. Especially now with this, this uh, whole curriculum war. Right. And it's like, what is the right way to teach? And of course, we're going to mm-hmm. get into that. You've come a long way from Sankofa Bookstore. What you know about that? Come on, chill. <laughs> chill, man. Yo, shut the camera. Scroll up to my face. Oh, it's a long time ago. I told you we came to do some research. I'm <laughs> do you have an audio podcast? Are you looking to grow your audience by expanding into video? Partner with Prosper Digital TV, a virtual and full service video production company with a dedicated team ready to expand your podcast into video. Visit www.prosperdigital.tv or call 718-622-0062 to get started today. The reason I brought up Sankofa, right? You had the same passion back then. I'm wondering if you had the same passion another 10 years ahead of that. Mm -hmm. It's the same passion we see now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got to understand where does that come from? How do you channel that to other people and what's the origin of that? It's my dad. Mm. Yeah. So my dad's a poet, you know. That's how he got my mama. Mm. Yeah, right? like, got him. <laughs> she was like, he got on my nerves. Then I found out that he wrote poetry. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's very much him. He's very outspoken. He's in marketing, right? He's very sad, mm. very smooth. Mm. Great pitch in and out of the boardroom, right? Like as a kid, he very much pushed me. Like he would always tell me like it's not how you start, it's how you finish. He mm. even bought a poster one time and like put it like I was doing my homework. He's like, I'm gonna put this on the wall. I'm like, dude, like <laughs> but he was very much adamant about me if I was go- if I started something, I needed to see it through. Mm-hmm. And then I needed to reflect. And that reflection needed to be intentional. What happened? Why did this happen? Who did it affect? Is that what I intended? Mm. And if not, how do I rectify? How do I remedy? Like, he really, I'm nine years old. He's walking me through, like, (laughs) all of these questions, right? analysis. Very much. Um, (laughs) And then my mother was the same, um, but she was much more softer about it. You Mm. know, she works in child welfare, so Mm. her nature's a little different. He's, like, logical business, and Mm. she's very, like, empathy, Mm -hmm. embrace. (laughs) And so I think the combination of them both... Right, like if you take those and put them together, that's literally who I am. Mm. Right, mm. I'm very much an entrepreneur, businesswoman. Very much. But I'm also an artist. I'm also very much a person who cares about the world and justice. Right. So I think like both of their personalities combined, that's who I am, mm-hmm. and that's where it began. So my dad spent a lot of time with me reading works that I don't think I would have been exposed to until college. Right. So mm. he had me reading Du Bois. He had me reading Hughes. He had me reading, you know, Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison. He was talking to me about duplicity and the veil and the way in which we go into a room and perform for a specific, you know, person mm-hmm. or gaze instead of being who we, we are in full. And little mm-hmm. did I know, I'm sitting in front of him like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then like I would I moved to suburbia and I'm like, wait a minute, those lessons are starting mm-hmm. to kick in, right? Like mm-hmm. now I've got to be this two people that I didn't have to be when I lived in Brooklyn, Mm. right? Um, I live next to Levittown, which is the nation's first sundown town, Mm -hmm. right? So in the North, a lot of people don't know that. So I say that to say that's where the origins of speaking up and expressing myself came from. It's very Mm -hmm. much to push from my mom and dad. And I would say it didn't really hit until I was a teenager. I was like, man, a lot of what they taught me, you know, I didn't think I needed, but I needed all of it, mm. every little piece. <laughs> and I, I'll never take it for granted ever again. And you also describe yourself as a public historian. Mm-hmm. Briefly take us through what that means. What made you even want to care about going into history specifically, mm-hmm. as opposed to just fighting the issues right now? You're going back and saying, hey, what does all of this mean? And that history is tied to right now. That's why, yeah. right? But if some so, people just go out and they're not learned, they don't know the right, history. They don't know they're just fighting, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. punching the air. Right. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> In school, sometimes <laughs> you sign up to do something, and depending on what the school needs, you can study English and they're like, you're going to teach math. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It really depends on what the school needs. I was at a school that needed a history teacher because the history teacher's father had passed away. You know, I said, okay, I'll help for a month or two. Turn this the whole year. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was teaching. They turned it into a 
humanities course <laughs> oh. where they merged uh, English and a ELA cohort. So 50 kids, and then they had to shift the teacher's room, the lounge, into a classroom to fit that many wow. kids. Yeah. So I'm teaching 50 kids at one time. Almost a one lecture hour hall. of ELA, one hour of history. Four different cohorts. Mm, that's it was nuts. Yeah, it was insane. You 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 know. <laughs> like, <'cause you're laughs> I, can, I can catch my eyes. Like, <laughs> no co teacher. <laughs> yeah, just me. Even How I know about that. Mm-hmm. How old are these children? This is middle school. This is sixth grade. But in teaching history, when I first came to the school, we did not have a textbook. We had a, an outline of the mm. different subjects they wanted us to teach. Mm. And we were allowed to kind of like make our own curriculum, which I thought was dope. Mm. I was like, oh, I really, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is my forte. Like, this is what I want to yes. do. Mm. And then maybe a month and a half in, they hired a curriculum director. And she was like, no. Mm. And she brought in a textbook. And it was the same textbook for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Uh-uh. Which is, uh-uh. Right, crazy. right. And it was like American History 101. And they were calling enslaved people workers in the book. And, and mm. they Back had, then? Yeah. I thought that was more recent. This was this was 2017. Okay, well, yeah. That was the same, that's the same, that's the same time yeah. I heard you about it. You gotta do it. a yeah. lot of trends. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm like, this is, this is wild. <laughs> you know, so I've always been passionate about history. But this made me very passionate. And I'm teaching across from Seneca Village, from Central Park. Mm. You know, so I'm like, the ancestors are probably looking at me like, <laughs> and so, so, you, so you just gonna give them that book <laughs> right <laughs> so I started to go out and um, seek archival materials on my own I would go to Brooklyn Historical Society which is now the Center for Brooklyn History owned by the New York Public Library thank God yes. um, the Schomburg I would go um, I would call different spaces and just ask like hey right now I'm teaching this subject and I want I'm looking for letters I'm looking for maps I'm looking for narratives that you know, my students can analyze and learn more about this movement from a more local perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Because when we talk about different movements, they, we often remove mm-hmm. New York from the narrative. And I'm like, come on, let's not play that game. Like everything the South was doing, y'all was doing too. Mm-hmm. You might have let go right. like it earlier, but you was doing it too. It's not right. quite the safe haven that they marketed it right. as. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of the prominent figures we talked about didn't look like the kids I was talking I was talking mm. to. So I wanted to find your Samuel C. Anderson, second black man to own land in Brooklyn on Hunter Fly Road, which is now King's Highway. Mm. And basically is the reason why central Brooklyn is predominantly black. Once he bought that land, black folks just started moving in. Mm. And James Weeks, who Weeksville is named for, Weeksville, yeah. came after Samuel C. Anderson. Mm. People don't know that. Mm. Right? Um, so I brought, I wanted to bring his narrative to the classroom. I wanted to talk about Jackie Robinson, not just from a baseball perspective, but from a political perspective. A lot of people don't know about Jackie and his shift from Republican to Democrat and his sports writing to political writing. Mm. Like, I wanted to bring all of those things into the classroom when I was talking about those movements, Mm -hmm. but I didn't have access to the resources. Mm. Most of what you found online was summarized in some, like, secondary way. I was Mm -hmm. like, no, I want their voices. Mm -hmm. I want their artifacts. So, I know it's a really long answer. No, no, no. (laughs) Get into it. This is perfect. um, I really... You know, wanted to use that instead. So I started to rebel. Like I would bring in my own curriculum, and the kids. And there's actually a term for it now. The book came out last year, I think, and it's by Jarvis Givens. It's called Fugitive Pedagogy, mm. and he talks about how when Carter G. Woodson was giving out materials to schools, teachers were like teaching it under the desk, uh-huh. mm. and the print the principals would come in, and they would like pretend like the kids would know, like we. We're moving on to spelling. Like, well, meanwhile, they were like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And so I remember reading that and going, oh, my God, that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Because there were moments where I would teach kids things, and the principal would walk in, and I would switch what I was teaching. And the kids just knew. They were like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, and, right? Wow. So, Isn't so we were doing fugitive wow. pedagogy. Had no idea that's what we were doing. Are you enjoying the conversation? Please like and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to hit the bell for notifications and be the first to know when new episodes drop. Do you have any nuggets of wisdom to share? We'd love to hear from you on the nuggets you've learned. Please comment below. Can you share a little bit about their engagement and like their family's responses to that? Because I'm just reflecting on what's happening currently that you almost feel guilty or wrong for teaching the actual truth. So how do the families and the kids respond to all that? Oh, they loved it. I've never had a family complain Mm -hmm. about what I was doing. In fact, to this day, I have a lot of relationships with uh, their parents Mm -hmm. that 
just they didn't need to talk to me after that year, right? Mm. But they continue to talk to me because they're like, I have yet to experience what my child experienced in your sixth grade mm-hmm. course. I opened my classroom on Saturdays. I said, we're going to learn the National Common Core Standards. If this is something that your kid has to be held up to, you should know it too, right? Yep. And they're like, well, I'm working Monday to Friday. Okay, I'll be this Saturday. Come mm-hmm. to my classroom. Mm-hmm. We're going to learn together, right? Wow. Um, and so they remember that. They remember me making caveats for them. And they're like, we will never forget that. Mm-hmm. So even just now, I just tweeted, I did an HBCU week, which is something I fought for mm-hmm. at our school. Mm-hmm. I was like, I think we should go through the process of specialized high school application slash test, mm-hmm. as well as the private school stuff. I think we should also do college application, like mock. Mm-hmm. And they were like, sixth grade, that's a little early. I was like, mm-hmm. I think we should, because it's the same process happening over and over and over again, just in different forms. And we need to let them know what's coming. I mean, a lot of schools don't do that, and parents are finding out the last minute you're rushing to get their kids mm-hmm. these tests, right? If you're a parent who's an immigrant family, mm-hmm. let's say, and you don't know that a, a test exists to get your child into the best schools, then how can you prepare them for mm-hmm. it? Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? So um, I did a lot of that work, and I had a mom DM me Friday, and she was like, yo, mate, so Mason, a kid, he was in my um, FAMU cohort, because mm-hmm. we named them after HBCUs, and then we had this woman, Janelle, come in and talk about her experience at FAMU, then he filled out a FAMU application, and he picked out his major, he was like, well, I need to go to this high school, because this is what aligns with my major. Look at that. And Mason was so serious, and I was like, okay, Mason, whatever. <laughs> like, because I'm like, we're going to see, we're going to see. And his mom was like, Mason got into the engineering program at FAMU. Get out. And I was like, that little week really triggered mm-hmm. like a kid changing his whole mm-hmm. life just to get into that school. More of that, And that's please. the fourth parent from that cohort <laughs> that told me that. So that's how that shows up today. I hope, I, I feel like I, I went on a tangent. I'm so happy that you did that work because I always try to impart to my parents that I see their kids as like adult seeds. They're going to grow up one day and they're going to need certain skills, certain understandings. I'm so glad that you had that kind of response and support. Also, I show up at jobs and I knock on doors. That's another thing. I learned that from Jeffrey Canada mm-hmm. when I was at Harlem Children's Zone. Mm-hmm. Like he was like, Oh, you can't hear from a parent? They work at Red Lobster up the block? Go to Red Lobster, get you some biscuits, have a conversation. And I was like, You serious? Okay, I'm about to do that. And it's worked a few times where I'm like, Mom's like, I'm busy, I don't have time. He's your problem. I'm like, cool, what you doing? Wow. Oh, well, I work at this restaurant. I'll be there at seven o'clock tonight. That's when you get off, let's have dinner. And I'll, that's my compromise, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. I know that we're all, we have so much on our plates and sometimes we're burned out and asking a teacher to step out of the official capacity or whatever we do every day is a lot. Mm-hmm. But when I was in those spaces, like I just felt like, then who? Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't ask anyone who feels overwhelmed to do that. But for me, I just kept saying to myself, but who else mm-hmm. did it? Uh, I mean, I, I could relate to the passion of that you have because I was a byproduct of just a really dope school. I don't know if you're at Frederick Douglass Academy. Oh, my really good friend, Charles Hamilton, okay. out there, okay. yeah, who's an okay. MC, And okay. they had studios in the basement after years. Wow. Mm. Hey, yeah. Dr. LaVeigh Monroe, mm-hmm. she uh, completely changed my life. You know what I mean? And I ha- I mean, we were, to what you were saying, we were in the news consistently because she was like, we're going to use different textbooks. And she had to go fight to get those textbooks into the school. And she just like was fighting the entire system to make sure that we were getting the same curriculum as the schools that were in Stuyvesant and, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and the other schools. So I know from a personal experience, just the difference between like that made into my life. School was my home. And just to have those teachers, I mean, I was just sharing with you guys, right? Like, my first glasses was purchased by a teacher. My first contact. Wow. Because was, she was like, I was like this. I couldn't, I was playing volleyball. She's like, why Why do you keep missing the balls? <laughs> <laughs> missing the ball or getting hit by it. But teachers would do that. They would just do it because it was like, it was needed to get done. Mm-hmm. And you're like a person that's like, it's needed. I'm doing it. But then I also realized they had their own lives to live. So I'm curious, like, how do you keep that passion for, for teaching and for educating in the different ways that you do? First of all, I want to say that 
FDA has really good ancestral energy. Mm. Um, there used to be a Harlem Renaissance jazz club in the same location that FDA is in. Mm. And the only reason I know that is because I researched someone's history from a picture. And I, there's this like crazy group on Facebook that's like, if you put up an old photo, they will find out where that photo was taken. Like, uh. They are obsessed with investigating photos. And they were I like, oh, who's that? This speakeasy. And I like looked it up and, and it was like, this speakeasy is now FDA. And I was like, what? Mm. And so... I was like, that makes sense because mm-hmm. every good musician, artist like mm-hmm. that I'm, I know from Harlem, always connected to either FDA or Beacon, like mm-hmm. every single time. So I feel like it has really good ancestral energy. I yeah. love watching content like that. It's like, <laughs> this used to be. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Just walking around New York because it was the same. You sent me something recently, right? <laughs> what, what it used to be before, like the, oh yeah, yeah, that was, that was Seneca Village. Okay, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Crazy. And and I, and I and I love that because specifically in New York, New York has this ability to renew itself for the good and the bad, mm-hmm. right? Peel back those layers. Mm-hmm. It can be exciting to see, okay, what used to be here, what actually used to be here, and so I'm really getting to the myth busting mm-hmm. that you do. My sister said she loves your uh, YouTube show. <laughs> Honestly, myth busting is something that's incredibly needed right now because there's a war on facts. Especially as hard as people fight to bury it. To they're, bury burying, the yeah. they're burying the facts, the information, like they're burying physical spaces. Right. Here you are trying to teach, and now you're like spending a lot of time saying, no, that's not true. What are you talking about? Workers. Do you find yourself doing more, more of that? There was two questions I want to answer both. <laughs> oh, you never answered nah, him? That's right, that's right. My bad. I got it, I got it. <laughs> You're good question. though. You're good at the fact that I was like, hold on, Jay. I thought you did. I'm going to let him go. I said, all right, go ahead, Jay. This question nah, turned into a statement. I was like, all right, so, my bad. The first, the first question, first of all, I keep myself around the community that I serve. Mm-hmm. And I think that when people start to ascend in a certain way, a lot of them forget who they serve, right? And you can't afford to forget who you serve. So if I work for children and I'm not around children, how dare I say I work for... You see what I'm saying? Mm. So I make sure that if I am doing this work for children... So an example is Langsley hires kid turns, right? And so my curriculum company could just have a bunch of adult consultants Mm -hmm. having these conversations. But no, there are kids in the room sometimes. And those kid turns will tell us, now this whack. Like, and we got to sit that, sit down and unpack that and be honest about why they think it's whack I or love that. they'll say I really love this but you should add that or like one really good feedback was yo a lot of the people that y'all write about are dead and like yeah. when a kid said that to us it was like you know history is also people that are still here and I was like Ooh. like they call this out right now like was he a know? poet no, that's a, that was a poet energy right he there. He just said that. And we were like, absolutely. And he said, yeah, you know, I, we should honor the dead. But I, I really would love to hear about people who are part of the movement that are sitting here now that I can give them their flowers. And we were like, thank you, Jason. Like, yes, like yourself. Not to say we don't know that, but like sometimes kids look at you like, this is cool, but... And they drop some nuggets, right, on you. <laughs> and you're like, Ooh, I, okay, I hear you. Mm-hmm. So that's how I sustain my passion mm-hmm. is I keep myself around the work, right? I could mm-hmm. be out here on Twitter and at the events and did, and all that's nice, right? right? But more than often, you'll find me with my god kids, with my cousins, at my homegirl school. Like, you'll find me at client or, like, events. Clients are always shocked to see me. I'm like, why? Like, they're like, oh, you came. I'm like, yes. Like, I want to be around the kids. And the kids is just dropping knowledge on you. And you're hearing feedback in real time about something you designed in a cluster of adults. And then, you know, they don't know you're in the room sometimes. And they're like, well, we really like the curriculum, but here's what, what could have been better. I want to hear that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I want to talk to them, you know? I want to hear their input. So that's what keeps my passion going. And I think that a lot of folks who are burned out from the work need to reimmerse themselves in the why again, mm. right? So when I got burned out, what I would do is I would leave work and I would just go and spend time with kids that I didn't have to teach, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? Because there was no they would obligation. reinvigorate me, right? Okay. And I feel like there's like, and it wasn't the kids, right? It was like the surveillance. It was the educators, um, the administrators like popping into my room every 10 minutes like, and, and then don't forget this and don't forget. And I'm like, dang, like, I've heard that can I just be with the kids? Like, it was a lot. And so I I would be burned out. Sometimes it was like, yeah, the kids are 
gone, but now I need this day to put on the wall and this written up and this in the folder on the door. And the next thing I know, I look at the clock and I'm calling my mom at 1030 at night. Then I've been there since 7 a.m. Like, yo, mom, can you come get me? I can't make the train. My feet are killing me. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and so it wasn't the kids. It was all the stuff around the kids. And I would just have to go sit with my goddaughter, Madison, who was probably like 12, 13 at the time, or my godson, Shawnee, and be like, yo, what y'all doing? And they'd be like, yo, I'm playing this game on PS5. You probably don't know about my yo, put me on. Like, teach me. Probably like, don't you know, know about it. <laughs> show, teach me something. Like, mm-hmm. and that would reinvigorate my passion. And I remember my why. This is why you're doing the work you do, Erica. Because mm-hmm. you like to be in the space with these, with these kids. Them teaching you and you teaching them. Mm-hmm. And I like to look at myself as really a facilitator. Mm-hmm. I don't... I don't feel like there's an authoritative, like, like sure, I'm going to keep the space safe. I'm going to ensure that we mm-hmm. have rules to keep us, you know, good. But I just like to have conversation in my classroom. I don't like to, you know, and you do this now. And you, no, I'm just like, here's what we're talking about. And I'm going to sit back and I'm going to let y'all talk. And I'm going to facilitate. I'm going to ask questions that's going to progress the conversation. I think there's a difference between that mm-hmm. and being a teacher who stands at the perch of the, the classroom and pontificate. Like, mm. there's very much a difference. Um, that's how I stay passionate about the work. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then your question was the history aspect. Or, well, well yeah. yeah, like, basically, you, when you get into history and you start myth-busting, you become a fact-checker. Right. I'm wondering if you find yourself doing more of that work because there's so much, I hate to say it, fake news, right? Right. I, I, I'm very passionate right now about people using the word first, and using the word only mm. and using the words last, like they drive me crazy because I think it negates people who have not had the opportunity to move mm. in those spaces because of limitations placed upon black and brown people in this country. God, do journalists love a headline that's like mm. the first black person to, and I'm like, Lord, can you stop that? Mm-hmm. Can you just make the announcement without adding those words? Because you're negating so much history. The other day I saw, for instance, Somebody wrote, like, this is the only enslaved person or the last enslaved person. I said, that's not true. That person passed away at a home for the aged with 17 other people who were also enslaved, <laughs> like, at one point in their lives. And they died after him. Like, mm. like why do y'all do that? And I get it. It's for clicks, right? Mm-hmm. But what happens when we do that is we bury so many narratives that need to be told. So I would say right now, that's like a big myth-busting thing for me, is like when I catch those things, I'll go on Twitter mm. and be like, nope, this is not true, and let me tell you why. Bop, 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 bop. And I make sure that I make all of those links accessible, because that's another yes. thing. It's like, so much of that is hidden behind intu- institutional firewalls, paywalls. Like, people can't find the truth because you gotta go to Harvard to get it. Like, there are databases that have so many artifacts and archives that are only accessible to Ivy Leagues. Why? Mm. Right? And mm. so it's just very stressful um, because folks will be like, what? And, and here's another thing. Some, it ain't always. It's, sometimes it's us. <laughs> yeah. Right? Who are like, well, on Wikipedia. And I'm like, oh, my Ooh. God. Right? Like, I'm like, I got people screenshotting Wikipedia and coming at me like, well, on Wikipedia it says. And I'm like, I'm sorry. In box 35, in this person's paperwork mm-hmm. that they gave to this institution and paperwork seven, it states on this letter in their handwriting that like I have to like that's but that's part that with that's, like that's part know. of the fight right. knowing your source right? right that's like a rule in journalism like consider the source mm-hmm. first rule and so the general public has lost that you have a lot right. of people who just don't know how to research mm-hmm. and just telling people look it up is not enough anymore you're just right. leaving the problem to fester people don't can't trust sources and you have a legitimate source that people are like no that's fake and it's like how do you get around that right i'm wondering and this may be a huge problem for you to solve save us (laughs) save us (laughs) that's all i wanted to say i think that also we can loosen up language too right like if you don't know for sure say could be Right, like say something else, That's like true. not the only, the first, the la- you don't know that for sure, mm-hmm. so don't do that. Mm. Right, I think that really good journalists who you'll find that, like a PBS, right, will say that, but then the sensationalists mm-hmm. who are at mm-hmm. you know major networks, like they care more about the like let's get it viral than mm-hmm. they do about the actual like validity. And I just, if it, it's so frustrating because there's so many stories to be told. I was on a tour recently, I'm not gonna put anybody out there but some the mm-hmm. tour guide was like and Weeksville the, was the only black enclave in the 19th century in New York City I was like huh what are you what are you talking about 
talking about? Mm. You just erased Malbonville, Barren Island. Sheep's Head Bay Woods had its own entity. We don't know its name because they erased it so fast we couldn't even get its name. Tell me you snatched Little the Africa mic. Africa and Bushwick. Like, what do you, like, there's like 15 enclaves with names that have been lost to the archives. Did you snatch and the for, mic? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, like, yes. And then the whole tour was like, <laughs> what else? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, was like, I didn't mean, no, I'm not gonna, right? But I was like, just took somebody's job. Right. They're like, oh. <laughs> she, just, she pulled out a bucket and was like, yeah, so if you wanna, <laughs> your free trial's over. <laughs> Do you have an audio podcast? Are you looking to grow your audience by expanding into video? Partner with Prosper Digital TV, a virtual and full service video production company with a dedicated team ready to expand your podcast into video. Visit www.prosperdigital.tv or call 718-622-0062 to get started today. It seems like, you know, with the other craft that you have to express yourself, the classroom is just not the only place, right? So I'm curious about the other crafts that you're involved in to get that information out there and and self-expression such as poetry and how you're using that and how you've used it to express yourself and and what does that work mean to you? So I paint, my medium is acrylic Mm. and I've been painting since I was a kid and I've always used my painting to tell stories about us or, you know, just to ensure that there are more reflections in the world, particularly of, of black women, mm-hmm. right? Because I felt like growing up, my mother surrounded me with a lot of paintings of black women. Mm-hmm. She was the type who would go to the dollar store, buy a, a white Santa and paint it black. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be like, Ma. Like, but no, but she was so it. adamant <laughs> about me having reflection. It was a bookstore back in the day in Brooklyn, in Kiru. That used to be owned by Tyler Qualley's mom, who's mm. now Dean at um Mega Evers mm-hmm. and oh, wow. Most Def now Yasin Bey. He used to work there too. They used to work there together as teens. Mm. Yeah. Um my mom would go in there and like be intentional about getting me books and with artwork that reflected me. So of course that like trickled in and now I'm like, I wanna paint these too, right? And so I always thought it was a hobby. Mm. And then the National Gallery of Art called this year and was like, hey, we'd like for you to teach a workshop in conjunction with our new exhibit, Afro-Atlantic Histories. And I'm like, huh? That's hey, what's up. On yeah. painting? I'm like, me? <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was one form of expression this year that I realized was something I could do professionally if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I had always felt like, I'm a poet, I'm an MC. How dare I veer into this other mm-hmm. space? Not how dare I, but I just feel like sometimes I can get too multi-passionate and I don't oh. want every, anyone to ever think I'm like, you know, Jill of all trades, master of none. Hold on for a second. Sounds like you're rebelling against yourself. Well, well, right? Better than well, master of one. Right? Yes. No, but, but yes. you know, we were talking, yourself, Jay was talking about, right? JP was just about some of the dope poetry that you spit. Mm-hmm. Why do you feel that way? By no means, right? Yeah. Have we heard of your dopeness and felt like... Because we're critics as well. We're like, well, that was whack, right? But, I mean, if you're doing it with excellence, who's to say, like, what where your excellence ends or begins? Because mm. um, when we were listening to your... You know, we were listening to River, we were like, damn, all right, that was, that was deep. And we were like, could she spit that? <laughs> and I don't know, I felt like you said, like, I was like you spent away for like you would. I did. Um, That's me being you know. honest. Like, you want me to? Yeah, lie. yeah. No, 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 no. And I was just like, wow, okay. Because when I look at you in the classroom, I see where that went. I see how that moved, and I'm like, okay, okay. I see. I could see the ebbs as to where that moved, and it didn't stop. Right. That's all part of who you are. I'm curious to why do you feel like you have to change that. I think people get on platforms like this mm-hmm. and they get very braggadocious, like, oh, I ain't done, don't that scare me, blah, blah, blah. I'm never gonna be like that. Mm-hmm. I'm always gonna be honest about like what I am afraid of too, right? Mm-hmm. And so while I am passionate about words, mm-hmm. which could be me lecturing a class, which could be me performing a poem, which could be me spitting rap, mm-hmm. painting was different. Like it was like, mm. maybe this ain't, I don't know, like, am I, am I doing this for real? To me, for a long time, I was like thinking with the equivalent of you went to a sip of paint, now you think you Picasso. <laughs> like, you know. Oh, because you're not formally trained. <laughs> right. I get it. So, right, so a little bit of right. imposter and, syndrome and is what I you're talking say, about? Say that one more time. Imposter syndrome? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be honest about that here. I don't want to come on here and be like, well, you know, they invited me because I'm 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 that I'm that girl. Like, no. <laughs> I was terrified to like show my artwork mm-hmm. outside of a few stories on Instagram. And 
people are watching. You just don't know. Mm. And they were like, oh, no, we know you paint. <laughs> like, mm. Let's go. Like, and I was like, okay. Yeah. So Kinda that's like where that comes from. like the kids who are like, we know you rap. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> that's crazy. So yeah. you're going to see We called that. you out. Like, right. yo. <laughs> You ain't come on us. We're like, yo, hold on for a second. Jay was like, yo, check this out. I was like, oh. No, no. I'm, now I'm curious about what you heard. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a long list of, you know, light hobbies that are actually dope that she does. I mean, I'm about to run down. We got to big you up. Just, just Interior design. <laughs> oh, my God. Style and fashion. Chill. Yo, look away. And then look back. And then look away. Chill. All right? <laughs> and cooking. Yeah. Now look. Oh, you, when you I picked tell that you, up though. You picked that because we saw. <laughs> Where is it? We saw. The yeah. pride came out. All yeah. right. She could change lives through words and through tacos. Okay. Ooh. Let me tell you. Yeah, so I yeah. wanted to big you up on that. Oh, and yeah. so, so what I find is that when people dive into their work, they kind of lose track of those things. These mm-hmm. other things that are not aligned directly with the paycheck, but feed your soul. I don't know if you're familiar with the curse of the gifted. It's the burden of knowledge itself. A lot of people are blissfully ignorant and you know so much and it's like, man, there's so many issues. I can't solve them all. Sometimes people put it all on their shoulders Mm -hmm. and they don't leave any time for themselves. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that you do to keep that balance? Or that you don't do. Or that you don't do, right. I would say that I'm very good lately Mm. of putting up boundaries, right? Mm. A lot of my friends do similar work. So, you know, I have like my homeboy, he's like a United States Poet Laureate slash, you know, he's got multiple books out. Also, my homegirl, she's um, editor at a major women's magazine. Like, Mm -hmm. so these are like people who are high achievers. I always call them and go, how are you doing this? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because I'm like, that was me for a while. Like, because I'm overwhelmed. And they were like, we're putting up boundaries and you Mm -hmm. need to figure out like what Mm -hmm. yours are. Because they look different for everyone. And so over the last few years, what they've looked like is one, I don't deal with tropes. So like I'm a very big online presence. And so once I recognize that, especially with this the stuff that's happening with critical race theory and yeah. conservatives, like yeah. that the trolls show up at night, I make my page private at night. Mm. Right? No one can touch it at night. If I'm gonna say something controversial, I'm going to change the setting to only I can reply to this. Like, mm. And th- that's a boundary. People don't realize like how much anxiety that quells mm. because I feel like I have to respond to a lot of things. Mm. The other boundary I've put up as well is ensuring that when I take time off, I'm off. Away message is up. Phone is on DND. Like, I- I'm not, there's no emergency in the world. If it ain't my mother and father, I don't know. <laughs> like, right. I'm sorry. There's no, I don't have kids. I don't like, <laughs> there's no emergency in the world that I need to hear about. If it ain't family, then I would also say another boundary is, you know, spending time with the people that I love every single day. And I know that sounds wild, but like, I make it work, right? Like, my mom, she works in lower Manhattan and I'm, and I live in Brooklyn, but she lives in Long Island. I'm like, girl, you know, you wanna come over Monday and Tuesday to, you know, have a shorter ride and relax. So, literally, we work all day and we'll have two hours together at night, Monday, Tuesday night. We'll watch some shows, we'll eat dinner together, and then she'll leave the next morning and come back like a slumber party. Oh, I love two days, it. right? Mm. Then my partner, I see him mm-hmm. on a specific day. My dad and I have a bonding day every week. Mm-hmm. So what is that might look like a Zoom where we're, we're sharing notes on work. That might look like, you know, some coffee and like breakfast in New York Times, mm-hmm. right? Every single day I need to be with a loved one. That on the weekends, it's my 94-year-old grandmother. So I have friends who I talk to and they're like, dang, I ain't see my grandma in, mm-hmm. you know, three months. I'm like, your grandmother lived in Canarsie. That is not okay. <laughs> like, right? And so- Just hop on the L. Right, uh-huh. like I know it's a trike, but you will be all right. Like, <laughs> I see that as a boundary. Like so many people will say to me, like, "Yo, you come to this event?" No, tonight is for mom, and Monday is always for mom. Mm-hmm. Time I'm blocking, sorry. time right? blocking. Yeah. So I think that that for me, people, who people mad about that? I'll tell you, like, <laughs> some people have called me and been like, "You not gonna come?" No, this is dad day. Are you enjoying the conversation? Please like and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to hit the bell for notifications. And be the first to know when new episodes drop. Do you have any nuggets of wisdom to share? We'd love to hear from you on the nuggets you've learned. Please comment below. I think that's the other side of the boundaries, right? Like, Mm -hmm. what does it say? The only people who mind you having them is those who you need to have them with. 
they would have been trying like to that. push on you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to that, I had read on your um one of your posts on on Instagram. You had wrote that there was so much urgency in the last decade of my life, and I deserve stillness. That's my word for this year. Yeah, stillness. Still. Yeah. yeah. What does that look like right now? And 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 because it's so so busy. Stillness looks. Um, let me see. You know, I, I, actually, I actually think this is the first public outlet I'm gonna say this on. Right. So honored. <laughs> I just signed a book deal. Ooh, for two congrats. Books. Yeah. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> and I also just signed a television deal. <laughs> so stillness, the definition has changed over these last few months. So it went from being like having time to cook a full meal for myself mm. and just enjoy with some wine or having time to dream. Like, oh. I think that visionaries need time to dream. Yes. And I don't mean brain trust. I don't mean Zoom call. Like, I mean, like, sit in a space that is entirely yours, whether that is a staycation at a hotel, a room in your home that you've removed every like electronic device and just with your post it and just dream. Right? Like, what do I want for myself? What do I want my morning routine to be? What do I want my night nighttime routine to be? That's what it used to look like. And now I would say it still looks like this with the, that with this added thing is now I have time to dream in pockets. I would say that stillness for me looks like having a quiet home for an entire day just to be able to write to my heart's content to ensure that you know, I get those chapters out on time because sometimes that used to look like a multitask. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like trying mm -hmm. to knock this out, answering call. I, I can't do that anymore. Like I have to same really like <laughs> I have to zoom in. And I used to take pride in that. I, I was, I, if I could go back to 25 year old me, I'd be like, "What's wrong with you?" Like <laughs> I was like, "Yo, I'm work. I'm writing a book right now, and I'm in this meeting." And no, <laughs> like mm -hmm. now I'm like, "No, I need stillness to get this done." And even with the television show that I'm working on, I have a wall in my office where I just mapped out every single episode. I needed time to do that as well. So for an entire week, I was like, I love y'all. Here's what I need. From this time to this time, every single day this week, I don't want to hear from anybody. <laughs> like, yeah, uh -huh. But y'all, d and and this is all I'm going to work on because I know I got this thing coming up. That's what's and up. And that's not work for me. I'm beyond. Like, that for me is fun. Mm -hmm. So still has gone from, you know, just the general self-care stuff to also self-care that is rooted in my work. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, I get it. Self-care yeah. that's yeah. functional and not just recreational. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I, mean, I get yeah. that. What did you do and what were the skills that you actually gained to be able to get to that place where you could land a book deal, where you could land a TV deal? And did you have any hurdles along the way? Like, oh, I, yeah. I wasn't getting that. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Ooh, okay. So I published, I self-published four times by myself between, mm -hmm. I would say, age 23 and age 28. I, I took those that. books off the internet, though. Because... Mm -hmm. We grow on beyond that. Okay. But, <laughs> um, I, I I'm used not to, pulling it up. I Don't worry. Write, nah, you good. I used to write about love a lot. Like, for my demographic at the time, which were, you know, young 20, right? Like, it was like, ooh, what is it? Right. But um, I very much shifted gears. Mm -hmm. And so in that self-publishing self space, I remember a mentor saying to me, I was like, I think I'm going to self-publish. And he was like, okay, I got a, I got a question for you. Do you want to be the machine? Right? Or do you want the machine to work for you? And I was like, what's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, that's the difference between publishing and self publishing. When you self, um, you self publish, you are required to market your book, mm -hmm. create your cover. Like, even if you have someone else do it, you still gotta go hire yeah. that person. Like, he's like, there's a lot of stuff involved in that. And then when you publish, like, yeah, you're not gonna have as much freedom as you would if you self publish, but somebody's working for you. He said, but also, there are times in your life that call for one, and there are times in your life that calls for the other, right. right? And I didn't really understand that until very recently. So I was like, well, yeah, whatever. I'm publishing my books. I published four books, and then I would say the first book did really well, but then after that, they would always cap like mm. at, a, at a number, and I couldn't get them to sell beyond that cap. And I was mm. like, dang, he was right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't have time to be the machine. I wish I had more time. So I, I got a literary agent. That literary agent was very adamant about me writing a memoir that all my mentors didn't think I was ready to write. Mm. And I was like, that's not what I pitched you. Though. I want to write fiction. Uh -huh. And she was like, no, I want you to write a memoir. So I was like, okay, well, you can't be my agent. So I had to let her go. Then I had another agent. This was 
last year. And I said, you know, I, I really want to write this fiction work. She was like, okay, cool. Like, let's send it out. So we sent it out. And the I think the first offer we got was $5,000 advance. And I don't think we talk about numbers enough. Yeah. Like, that irritates me. It's like everyone talks about deals, but we don't talk about numbers. I'm going to talk about numbers. Beautiful. Right? We love it. Um, and I was like, I laughed. I was like, <laughs> you joking, right? Like, like, <laughs> and she was like, well, you need to be grateful. Because a lot of people in, oh. in this industry never get to publish. And so, you know, like, I would take this if I were you. I said, so you're going to take the first offer we get. At this agent? level, I say, you also okay. fired. <laughs> so I let that person go as well. So then my current agent had been emailing me for a while, and I was like, I'm going to take a chance on him. So I messaged him back. I told him what I'd been through, and he's like, yeah, none of that here. Like, I really believe in your work. And he started telling me things very much like what you're doing now about myself that I didn't know anyone knew. So I said, oh, you did your research. I like you. He actually got me an advance that, None of my friends who have published have ever seen, and then, mm. so that's that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, there's a, a, a publishing a book is a waiting game, like mm. in, in the mainstream publishing. So it's very much like you're waiting someone to read the work, the proposal you said, mm. and then after you have someone read the proposal you said, you're then waiting for someone to you know hit you up and give you an offer. Like what do the numbers look like? Mm. Then it's a whole negotiation between mm. agent and lawyer, right? Like. We don't want that. We want this right. Blah, blah, blah. And then after that, once you sign, you've got a whole two-year editing, mm. writing, and revision game before you actually go to print. Like, publishing is not for the fate of heart. Like, mm-hmm. if you are the type of person who's like, I need it now. Mm-mm. Not for you. You need to go self-publish because it's a whole process. And I'm glad I went through all of those hurdles because when the time came, I knew exactly what I needed and exactly what I wanted. And I was able to communicate that to my literary agent, to the publisher, and I got all the things I asked for. I think the journey was necessary. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. But with the the television, say I would say the same thing applies, right? I was in a production deal. So they they found my YouTube, which they loved, and they're like, you know, do you have any show pitches? And I was like, yes. So I uh, fleshed out a pitch based off of my YouTube series. Oh, nice. and which one? I, uh, so my YouTube series is called Decolonize. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The pitch is very similar theme, mm-hmm. but um, different content. I sent it over to them. They're like, we love this. We'd love to sign you. So they signed me, and then we signed an executive producer, and then that executive producer got a first look deal with an, another major production company. Ooh. So that production company was like, "Well, we want to see what you know what you're working on." So right. she brought me to them, and then they signed a co-production deal. So, ah. so now we are in conversation with like major streaming and like um, networks right now. That major production company that we signed with, like that's the the deal that I signed. I never in a million years would have TV, like never. <laughs> I would also say that is a, a waiting game as well. Mm-hmm. Two years, right? So I made Decolonize in 2020 with no intention to be on TV. And then someone found me and said, you know, we, we think your threads are great. We think your YouTube's great. Like, we'd love for you. This was Jenny Hagel from the Amber Ruffin show. It was like, we'd love for mm-hmm. you to write oh. our, a segment for Amber Ruffin. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, so I wrote this segment well, how did we get here? Yes. And it was like social commentary about how something that happened today had a whole history and we're going to tell you how you got here. So mm-hmm. I wrote it. Michael Harriet wrote it. We had Michael Harriet. Other, yeah. Funny on Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> a, few, a few of us were in the writing space for that segment. And so once I started writing segments for them, the production company that I was working with was like, oh, this is good because we could just add this to your pitch. So that I made me, it. you know, like that made me get a little bit of clout. And then now... The executive producer was like, okay, I'm going to sign on to this. And then that's how <laughs> mm-hmm. the current deal happened. You deserve so, all of it. That's all the amazing. hurdles. That's amazing. Yeah. Worth A lot yeah, of people yeah. don't get this, you know, that path, that track. Curious, when you held out on that 5000 mm-hmm. what was the new number that you actually got? So I have media training. <laughs> 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 so you're supposed to give me a number and I'm supposed to tell you if it's nearby so <laughs> we'll do that okay uh 500,000 oh no Lower than that. Lower than that. <laughs> okay. It's a first, first published book. Hey, you think we go for gusto. I'm like, first published book. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say 75,000. Close. Close? Okay. Yeah, that's so what I'll say. Nice. I'll say close. Yeah, close. You have a good sense of your self worth. What other experiences have you had that have built to that? Because it seems like you had other experiences that you had to say, mm, I'm valued more than that. 
Yeah, I had a one of those self published books that I had published. I actually, after the second one did like didn't do good numbers, I hired somebody to be my marketing manager, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Listen, I really want this one to do well. So even though I'm self publishing, I'm hiring you, mm-hmm. you know, to take it where it needs to go." He turned the book around and he looked at the back with the bio and the photo, and he just sat there for a really long time, and I was like, "Thoughts?" And he was like, "This book is about romance, but your face is on it." Mm. And I said, excuse me? Wow. And he's like, I mean, if I wanted to learn about romance from someone, they would need to look better than this. Mm. And I took my book up and I left. So, like, that's a very, like, I'm going to be honest with you. Oh, so you didn't swing? Okay. Oh. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) We was in Harlem at this nice restaurant, a lot of white people around. (laughs) I'm not going to jail today. (laughs) But um, I just picked the book up and I walked out. You know, I had a very similar experience where someone asked me to host a television show mm-hmm. and they were like, oh, well, you know, we can have you like host, but behind like kind of like a voiceover. Like we don't mm-hmm. want you actually like, I'm like, that doesn't that make sense. Even work. What am I, Morgan Freeman? Like, no, <laughs> it's not a documentary. Like, doesn't make any sense. And so then they were like, well, maybe you can write like the script for the host since you have all the knowledge and we'll find another host. And it was like, they were saying something but not Mm -hmm. saying it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, no. All these like corny industry standards Mm -hmm. about beauty and about like how you have to show up and who you have to be, out the window for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was very adamant about, I will be the host of whatever I create, right? Or anyone that I choose, Mm -hmm. that's number one. Number two, like if I'm writing a book, my face will be on it and my story will be on it. We're not gonna bend, flex, shift, change anything because it fits your agenda for what you feel societal expectations are, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if someone goes, oh, I don't want to read this because that they're not my tribe Mm -hmm. and that's okay because I have one. It's clear. Like they're, my analytics, I literally do between two to 10 million unique impressions depending on how much I tweet per month. People are listening. So you can't tell me that I'm like not going to be able to do the work. Like hearing that and then looking at my metrics, I'm like... (laughs) Come on, <laughs> like, the like math seriously, ain't with, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so that commentary and being in those spaces made me understand my value very quickly. Mm. Like, I was like, wow, like we're still dealing with superficiality in this way. Like, and I no one gets on the mic and talks about like I I, don't, I wouldn't say no one, but a lot of people don't get on the mic and talk about that mm-hmm. candidly. And I think that that's important for people to know. People in the industry that are like that, they they're still here, mm-hmm. and so you're gonna have to combat superficiality. You're going to have to combat what people think you're worth. You know, people email me to this day like, hey, we're promoting this thing and we want you to help us out and exposure. I'm like, huh? (laughs) Right? And I'm like, I'm I'm exposed. You wouldn't have found me if I wasn't. Right? So that's those those situations made me realize my worth really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear how boundaries and standards hold hands for you Mm -hmm. in your decision making. You shared a ton of nuggets here with us about the elements of your boundaries and your stillness and making time to dream and re-envisioning how we use words. Like All of these nuggets have been so valuable. Um, is there a particular nugget you'd like to leave on the table as your final nugget for our nugget audience? I said nugget a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, branding. I would say uh, anybody listening... Don't limit yourself by anything, like by age, by experience, by whatever, right? Like if you feel very adamant about something that you want to do, position yourself to get it done and get it, you know, get it to the world. I think we limit ourselves so much. And even in this moment where, you know, you pushed me and you said, like, why would you think that there's a limit, right? Like even I have to continuously check myself, on that as well every day. So like I'm a multi-passionate person. I'm a person of multiple talents. And if I sat here or sat anywhere and said like, oh, I don't think I can do this work, mm. I wouldn't be where I am. Mm. And so if you're listening and anything that we said sparked you today, go with that. Honestly, like some of our other guests, you can Google her. <laughs> but for the record, marketing, mm-hmm. share with the audience where they can find you and all the places you want them to follow you. Well, I'm at Erica Buddington everywhere. E-R-I-C-A-B-U-D-D-I-N-G-T-O-N. So that's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Consistency. LinkedIn. Consistency. All that jazz. Yeah. Marketing 101. <laughs> and right now, there's a headquarters in Bed-Stuy 
that is the headquarters of a mutual aid organization owned by black women called the United Order of Tents. They were started in the 1800s by two formerly enslaved women to ensure that folks get everything from buried with dignity to maternal health to just the welfare of our people. And they are still doing that work to this day. They're all over the Eastern Seaboard, but they are in danger of losing those headquarters. It's a beautiful mm. mansion at 87 McDonough Street in Bed-Stuy. I think I walked by there. Mm. Yeah, I saw the plant. It's mm. beautiful. It's above yeah. the door. Mm -hmm. mm. And so they're in danger of losing that space. And as you know, gentrification comes swift. And so um, if you have it in you, Donate to their GoFundMe. You can find it all over my Twitter, all over my Instagram um, to help preserve their home. And that's a wrap. That is a wrap. Thank, Thank you. you.